I had to struggle with personal development. It was hard for me to give up my old blame list. It was so comfortable blaming the government, blaming my negative relatives and the company, company policy, unions, wage scale, economy, interest rates, prices and circumstances. All that was difficult for me to give up. That was quite a transition for me to make and blaming myself. But Mr. Sh started out with something very, very important. Let me give that to you, he said. It's not what happens that determines the major part of your future. It's not what happens. What happens happens to us all. He said, the key is what you do about it. It's not what happens, it's what you do about it. And he said, if you will start that process of change, do something different the next 90 days than you did the last 90 days, like picking up the books to read, do something different like the new health disciplines, relationship with your family, whatever it is. It doesn't matter how small it is. If you'll start doing different things with the same circumstances, since we cannot change the circumstances, but we can change ourselves, we can change what we do. Then he gave me another secret to success when he said, what you have at the moment, Mr. Rohn, you've attracted by the person you've become. What you have at the moment, you've attracted by the person you become. A few simple principles here. Once you understand these, it starts to explain so much. Now, sometimes it's a little tough to take blaming yourself instead of the marketplace, taking responsibility instead of putting it off on someone else. That transition sometimes is a challenging mission and this one was a little tough for me. He said, Mr. Rohn, you've got pennies in your pocket. You've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling. You're behind on your promises. And he says, here's how that occurs. You've attracted up until now, you've attracted the things to you because of the person you've become. Now I said, well, how can I change all that? He said, very simple. If you will change, everything will change for you. You don't have to change what's outside. All you've got to change is what's inside. To have more, you simply have to become more. And then he said, don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. Start working on yourself, making these personal changes. And he said, it'll all change for you. So let's talk a little bit about personal development. In helping kids understand personal development, I always start with money. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Key to understanding economics. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. The marketplace is also described as reality. Reality, the marketplace. Now it takes time. It takes time to bring value to the marketplace, but we don't get paid for time. It's very important for kids to understand as well as adults. We don't get paid for time. Mistakenly, the man says, I'm making about $1.20 for an hour. Not true, not true. If that was true, you could just stay home, have them send your money. No, it's not true. You don't get paid for the hour. You get paid for the value you put in the time. So we don't get paid for time. We get paid for value. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of the afternoon. Is it possible to become twice as valuable and make twice as much money in the same time? Of course. If you want to really emphasize something, that's a good phrase to use. Of course, of course. Okay, now all you have to do to earn more money in the same time is simply become more valuable. America is unique. It's a ladder to climb. Starts down here, what about $4 an hour, right? This is not a bed, this is a ladder. This is a ladder to climb. Starts at $4. Now somebody said, well, it should be five, it should be five. Well, maybe if you're going to stay at the bottom for the rest of your life, it probably should be five but that's kind of a pitiful way to live. Start and not grow, start and not change, start and not become more valuable. Hey, the whole scenario of life is to start number one and what? Become more valuable, number two? Now, why would we pay somebody only $4 an hour? They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now we gotta make that distinction to the marketplace. Might be a valuable brother, a valuable member of the community, valuable member of the church, valuable member in the sight of God to the human family, of course, those kinds of values. But to the marketplace, which is called what? Reality. Reality is if you're not very valuable, you don't get much money. Those are called the facts. I mean, that's how that is. Well, then how do you get more money? Simple answer. Somebody says, well, I'll go on strike for more. Strike for, well, here's a major problem with that. Here's a major problem with that. You can't get rich by demand. Somebody says, well, I'm waiting for a raise. I'm telling you, it's easier to climb than to wait for a raise. Why not just become more valuable rather than wait? I'm telling you, that's the key to all good things, becoming more valuable. I got a telephone call five years ago. A company said, well, we're ready to expand internationally. We need some help. 
I was sort of semi-retired, right? Looking for the next exotic beach. They said, no, no, Mr. Roan, we've got a project for you, right? Going to expand internationally. We could use your help. Next little while, we'll add some millions to your fortune, make it worth your while. I said, okay. I thought later, isn't that interesting that they called me? My second thought was, of course they'd call me. Who else would they call? I mean, you know, I can get the job done. Now, how come? How come I got a telephone call worth millions? I had become valuable, valuable. Now, I'm a farm boy from Idaho. I was raised in obscurity. One year of college, and I thought I was thoroughly educated. Made all kinds of mistakes galore. At age 25, the creditors are calling me saying, hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I got pennies in my pocket. I got nothing in the bank. I'm behind on my promises. How come I get a telephone call five years ago and it's worth millions? I changed. I changed. I turned my life around. Is it possible to become worth millions? Speaking economically now, there's a lot of values to become, but let's just talk economics. Is it possible to become that valuable? The answer is, of course, of course. Now let me give you the secret. She said, here's the secret, Mr. Roan. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I got that, it turned my life around. Learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job, he said. If you work hard on your job, you'll make a living. If you work hard on yourself, you can make a fortune. Wow. If you would have known me at age 25, you would have said, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. Hard. If you'd have known me, you'd have said that. I'm the guy. I don't mind coming a little bit early. Stay a little bit late. I don't mind that. You'd have said, well, Jim Rohn's a hard worker. You say, well, how come he's got pennies in his pocket and nothing in the bank and behind on his promises? Well, I was a hard worker, but I was working hard on my job, not on myself. I'm telling you, if you'll learn that simple little principle and start the process today, latest tomorrow, I'll give you tonight to think it over and start this whole process of personal development, work on yourself, make yourself more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, you can so dynamically change your income and economics is the least of the values that you can start earning in terms of equity if you'll start working harder on yourself than you do on your job. Work hard on the skills. Work hard on yourself and develop the graces, all of the stuff necessary to become more valuable to the marketplace. I'm telling you, your whole life can explode into change. Promotions, no problem. Becoming more valuable to the company, I'm telling you, no problem. Money, no problem. Economics, no problem. Future, no problem if you just go to work on the right thing not get things out there to change. Don't try to change the seed, don't change the soil, don't change the sunshine, don't change the rain, don't change the mix of seasons. Let the miracle of everything that's available work for you and start working on the inside. Work on your philosophy, work on your attitude, work on your personality, work on your language, work on the gift of communication, work on all of your abilities. If you'll start making those personal changes, I'm telling you, everything will change for you. Today, you still have a real chance to turn your dreams into reality, to make yourself into exactly what you wanna be, no matter who you are or where you start from. That's why we should be doing everything we can to make the most of the opportunities that have been given to us. But I also say take care, or maybe even beware, because the stuff that really matters can get buried under everything else. The right stuff can get smothered under all the plastic and shiny metal, and what you've got becomes a little less important than what you are. I'm talking about character now. The ability to inspire yourself qualifies you, gives you the right, and makes you worthy to lead others. Does it seem to you that a lot of people are succeeding these days without the benefit of a strongly developed character? It does seem that way to me sometimes, but I think some very positive signs are beginning to appear. We're starting to realize that we'd better remember what got us this far if we expect to go any farther. I think one of the sharpest distinctions between people is between the small percent who look words up in the dictionary and the overwhelming majority that don't. I looked up the word character in the dictionary. I learned the origin of the word and then I just sat there for a minute and realized that in this case, the origin of the word just about says it all. Character is derived from the Greek word for chisel and of course a chisel is a sharp steel tool used for making a sculpture out of a hard or difficult material like granite or marble. A chisel is also used for stripping away waste material from an object, stripping away stuff that might get in the way in order to get down to the essential thing, the thing that really matters. 
You've got to chisel your character out of the raw material of yourself, just like a sculptor has to create a statue. The raw material is always there. Everything that happens to you, good or bad, is an opportunity for building your character. Character doesn't refer to other people. It doesn't refer to having power over other people or getting other people to follow you or gaining favor with other people. Character is something that you have and that you are. You could be marooned on a desert island and your character would still be important. In fact, it would likely be very important in that situation. But charisma wouldn't do you any good at all. Charisma requires the presence of others, while character is all about you. Character is the person you are after you've chiseled and have gotten past all the unnecessary material to what's underneath. The person of character looks within for the true source of inspiration and energy. Powerful personalities often resist delegating authority, but it's an attitude of character for a leader to refrain from making himself or herself the indispensable heart and soul of an organization. People of character are usually well loved by everyone around them, but they make it clear that their own first love is for the truth, even if it hurts. Character is the result of hundreds and hundreds of choices you may make that gradually turn who you are at any given moment into who you want to be. If that decision-making process is not present, you'll still be somebody, you'll still be alive, but you may have a personality rather than a character, and to me that's something very different. Character isn't something you were born with and can't change, like your fingerprints. It's something you weren't born with, and that you must take responsibility for making. You may not be able to cross the Rocky Mountains in a covered wagon, but you can still create a better life for yourself by crossing the mountains of your soul, and that may be an even greater challenge. There used to be a joke about football teams that lost every game. The coach would say, we built a lot of character this year, didn't we? As if character is something that you settle for when you haven't achieved what you really wanted, or as if character is something that automatically develops in you as a result of adversity. I don't buy that. I don't think adversity by itself builds character. And I certainly don't think that success erodes it. You can build character by how you respond to what happens in your life, whether it's winning every game or losing every game or getting rich or dealing with hard times. You build character out of certain qualities that you must create and diligently nurture within yourself. Just like you would plant and water a seed or gather wood and build a campfire. You've got to look for those things in your heart and in your gut. You've got to chisel away in order to find them, just like chiseling away rock in order to create the sculpture that has previously existed only in your imagination. But the really amazing thing about character is that if you're sincerely committed to making yourself into the person you want to be, you'll not only create those qualities, you'll strengthen them and recreate them in abundance, even as you're drawing on them every day of your life. Since ancient times, philosophers have seen it as the basis of all real achievement. This is the quality of courage. A truly courageous person is not someone who never feels fear, but who fears the right thing at the right time in the right way. Now, keeping in mind our idea that a courageous person is not someone who never feels fear, but who fears the right thing at the right time in the right way. Let's ask ourselves if these fears really fit that definition. I think if we look a little deeper, we'll see that what really scares people about these situations is the sense that they're going to be helpless, that all their trust was placed in somebody or something and now they've been let down and they can't do anything. They're helpless. But remember, you're never really helpless and the sense that you are helpless or that you might be if certain things were to happen is something we really ought to be afraid of and that we should refuse to accept. You're never just a victim of circumstances. No matter what happens, you're never without options that can get you back on track. It takes courage to recognize that because it means accepting responsibility for your own future. But I would suggest that we should accept that responsibility because no one is really going to accept it for us, no matter what we may have been led to believe. Let me emphasize that underlying most fear is the fear of helplessness, of being victimized or being blown around by the winds of fate like a leaf is blown off a tree. But is that really a legitimate way of looking at things? To me, it sounds like being afraid of the dark in which case the best thing to do is to get yourself up out of bed and switch on the light. After all, the people who built this country didn't feel helpless when they faced obstacles that we can hardly even imagine today. Your fears are about not living up to your ideals, about reacting instead of acting, about not taking advantage of the opportunities that are always within reach. 
A truly courageous person is not afraid of what might or might not happen next week or next year. He fears not making the most of every moment today. In ancient Greece, the philosopher Diogenes went searching for an honest man and he never found one. There was a time when telling a lie was very serious business. Lying was a very serious matter. It was also very serious if you accused someone of lying. Today, a breach of integrity in a business matter might mean calling in the lawyers, but for hundreds of years in the past, calling someone a liar was the most common way to provoke a duel. Dishonesty was treated like a personal insult that demanded immediate redress. Everyone knew the big problems that could arise if you got caught. So lying to another person took a certain amount of, what's the right word, foolish bravery maybe, but there's no such risk today, is there? Some people lie all the time without thinking about it. Most people know when they're being lied to, which they may find irritating, but they just accept it. Maybe they decide to become liars themselves. Many people don't feel the same kind of personal responsibility about paying debts promptly. And today, of course, we can put off paying for our purchases as long as we can make the minimum payment on our credit card. That pain that comes with having to shell out hard cash for something, the pain of maybe having to give something up in order to have this thing, we can avoid that pain. It's painful in just the same way that paying a big fat bill is painful. In fact, we even use the same words to talk about paying debts and telling the truth. We may talk about somebody's word being like money in the bank. We talk about being held accountable, about having to account for yourself, about being called to account. If you've done something that you're really not proud of and you're called to account for it, what does that feel like? How do you handle it? What are your options when you've got to explain something that makes you uncomfortable? It's a bit like that moment of decision when the credit card bill comes every month. If you want to pay off the whole balance, there may be some pain and sacrifice involved. You may have to grit your teeth. You know that your life will be simpler in the long run, but it's going to hurt a little right now to pay off the new golf clubs or the new computer, or how about the 60-foot yacht? I don't actually know if you can put a yacht on a credit card, but I've certainly known people who would if they could. Gritting your teeth and paying in full can hurt, so quite often it seems easier to pay the minimum and delay the pain until next month. It's easier to float the truth of your finances off into a little imaginary plastic flying carpet and sail it into the mailbox. Of course, it's not really a flying carpet. It's more like a boomerang that's going to come around and hit you in the back of the head someday. What a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive, said Sir Walter Scott. It's a line worth remembering because dishonesty always makes things more complicated and always comes back to haunt you, always. The best option when you've got a debt to pay or a truth to tell is to handle it right away so that you don't have to carry the burden around with you for any longer than is absolutely necessary. If there's someone you're indebted to, pay them off. If there's someone you're not being honest with, tell them the truth. There's an idea that lying is a means of gaining control over other people, but the reality is that you're gaining control over yourself and your life when you pay your debts and you tell the truth. A leader has to lead in that way. You can't ask someone who works for you to lie for you, and you can't lie to someone who works for you. If you start doing that, you're sacrificing your character. If you make a habit of it, you'll become known as a person without character. But what about diplomacy? Diplomacy is another thing. Diplomacy has to do with choosing your words carefully and sometimes delaying bad news until everyone is better prepared to hear it. If someone asks if the boss has been talking about them, it wouldn't be very diplomatic to say, yes, she has, and she says you're just about the worst excuse for an employee she's ever seen. If that's what the boss said, you may want to keep it to yourself for the time being while you try to figure out how you can be of help to both parties. If the boss says, can you get her out of here for half an hour? I got a lot of things to talk to you about and I don't want her around. It wouldn't be very diplomatic to say, yes, I can get her out of here for half an hour and I'll tell her why too. Sometimes the truth does more damage than good, but this is different from telling someone, don't worry, I'll take care of that check in the mail when you don't have the money in the bank and you know you're not going to have it next week either. Even though diplomacy is sometimes necessary and sometimes requires setting the truth aside, this kind of dishonesty is always a terrible mistake. There's no such thing as white lies and lies of omission are just as bad as any other kind. If you're a leader and you begin shading the truth here and there, Everyone around you will know it very soon. You'll begin to destroy the very trust and respect that you're trying to build, and you'll destroy your own self-respect at the same time.
A leader should always lead by example in thought, word, and deed. You should never expect anybody to do something that you're not willing to do yourself, and you should always be willing to pay whatever price that you ask others to pay. The person who insists on using my way or the highway isn't leading anyone. He's driving people away from him. And because the world doesn't work like that, sooner or later it's going to be the highway for him too. If you want to lead, you can forget about charisma. Develop character and trust. People follow you by choice, not because they have no choice. They follow you because they want to, not because they have to. And if you stop and think about it, you'll realize that there's really no other way to lead.